I'm 53 years old, and I think I may be having a midlife crisis. I'm not having an affair or buying a sports car, but I have inquired about having my first tattoo. It's not going to be massive or anything, but it will be important to me because of what it represents. I support a football club called Southend United. They're not very good, if I'm honest. In fact, last season, they were one of the worst in the whole football league. But they're my team. And I've supported them through thick and thin, mainly thin, for over 40 years now. And in that time, I've experienced so many lows, but a few delirious highs, like the time we beat a Manchester United team that contained Cristiano Ronaldo and Wayne Rooney, or a playoff final win at Wembley on penalties after extra time. They're my team, and I want to physically ingrain them onto my body. So my tattoo will be of a shrimp. It's part of the club badge. We're known as the Shrimpers. But of course, tattooing isn't a new thing. In fact, the oldest example of a decorated body was found on Ötzi the Iceman, who is Europe's oldest natural mummy and lived about 5,000 years ago and had 61 tattoos on his body. A couple of years ago, I went to New Zealand and I saw the tattoos or Tamoko on the Maori people. It was a sign of their cultural identity, a rite of passage, a way of showing that they belong to that tribal culture. Because that's what a tattoo is about, isn't it? It's about belonging. Whether you belong to a culture, a tribe, or a poorly performing Essex football team, it's a way of saying, this is me, I belong. But of course, tattooing doesn't only indicate belonging in a positive sense. I work for a charity called the Madai Trust, and we support survivors of human trafficking and modern slavery. A couple of years ago, a young lady came into one of our safe houses with a tattoo on her arm. What's remarkable about that, you may say? What's remarkable about that is that the tattoo was the name of her captor, the person to whom, in his mind, she now belonged. Like a farmer might brand their cattle, so this criminal had branded this lady to indicate that she now belonged to him. Alina, not her real name, is from Romania, and her story is now worryingly familiar to us. Her family background is marked by extreme poverty. So when an older, more affluent man showed interest in her, she was smitten. And her parents encouraged the relationship too because he offered her work and the chance of a better life. But of course she was being groomed and soon she was moved away from her family and she was forced into a life of prostitution against her will. She was beaten, she was raped and by the time she arrived at our safe house, she was broken. She was malnourished. She had terrible wounds where she'd been bound and had developed sepsis as a result. In fact, at one point, the doctors thought she may not make it at all. She had severe post-traumatic stress disorder and was frightened to ever leave the house. She was a shell of a person, broken, by the man who had inked her body, but scarred not just by the tattoo on her arm, but by the years of abuse 
she was scarred inside. Just before Christmas, my daughter moved from her family home in Essex to live in Bristol for her first permanent job after graduating from university. <laughs> I remember my excitement as her father thinking she'll be able to use her gifts and skills. She'll get a great job, she'll meet new people, it will be exciting. She'll have an employer who will treat her well and treat her with dignity and pay her and reward her for her hard work. I'm pleased to say that that was all true. I'm sure Alina's parents had the same hopes and dreams for their daughter. And didn't their daughter deserve the same respect and dignity as mine? When people ask me what I do for my job, they think that most of my work must be abroad because slavery doesn't exist in the UK today, right? Wrong. In 2018, the Global Slavery Index estimated that there are 136,000 slaves in the UK today. But of course, exploitation takes place behind closed doors, so that's not a precise number. And it's not just sexual exploitation of young ladies like Alina. In the UK, the number one type of exploitation is labour exploitation and men actually outnumber women. And slavery may be happening close to where you live. In a hand car wash, in a nail bar, working as a maid for your neighbour, picking the vegetables that you eat or the flowers that decorate your table. People are stripped of their dignity and exploited. If they're foreign nationals, their documents are taken. But actually, over the last few years, the number one nationality of slaves in the UK has been UK nationals. For people like Alina, there's a long road of recovery ahead. But I'm pleased to say she's showing remarkable resilience. We're working with her and a tattoo artist to transform the mark on her arm into a design of her choosing, indicative of her right to choose, of her new freedom. 12 months ago in Bristol, the statue of the slave trader Edward Colston was torn down and thrown into the harbour, a protest against the veneration of a man who made his fortune through human suffering. Colson was a member of the Royal African Company and his victims were branded with the initials R-A-C to indicate that they now belong to him. And what then followed was a nightmarish six to eight week journey to the Americas. The people who protested against Colston did so because they recognised that making a profit from human suffering was wrong and what happened in the 17th and 18th century shouldn't be celebrated. And I think these people would be equally as enraged when they realise that today in their communities people are still branded, they still endure nightmarish sea crossings and people are still exploited whilst others make a profit from human suffering. The ending of modern slavery is not just something that should be left to the police, to the criminal justice system or to charities like the Madai Trust. It really needs communities to come together to speak out and act against this abhorrent trade. And if I could ask you to do just three things today, it would be these. Firstly, learn to spot the signs of modern slavery. If someone appears frightened or mistreated, then they could be a modern slave. 
Secondly, don't ignore it. Report it to the police, to the local authority, or to a charity like the Madai Trust, who will know what to do next. And thirdly, please make ethical decisions about your purchases. If it only costs a fiver for six chaps to wash your car by hand, then people may be being exploited. If they're not wearing proper PPE and appear frightened of the boss, then that could definitely be the case. We all have a bargain. But if something is cheap, it's because somebody else could be paying the price. Modern slavery exists in the UK today. People like Alina live in fear and are being exploited. But I believe if as communities we truly come together, we can stamp out modern slavery. And if we show the same passion as the people on the streets of Bristol in June 2020, we can eradicate this abhorrent trade once and for all. I'd like to leave you with the words of William Wilberforce, a contemporary of Edward Colston, and as someone who campaigned tirelessly for the abolition of the slave trade, I would presume his arch enemy. Wilberforce said, you can choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. Thank you. <laughs>